Quick glance at the clock means you're watching the press preview. Our first look at the front pages as they arrive. Time to see what is making the headlines and the inside pages with the journalist and author Ian Dunt and the Spectator's political editor Katie Balls. We get our money's worth from them. They will be with us from now until just before midnight. With you guys in just a second, uh, but let's run you through the front pages, beginning with the Belfast Telegraph. It, of course, is covering the massive data breach and quotes the chief constable of the PSNI, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Simon Byrne. Uh, he is insisting, I am not going to quit. This is my responsibility. Now, here's the Express. It leads with an exclusive saying that ministers are warning of a surge in small boat arrivals across the Channel in coming months. While the number of migrants reaching British shores across the Channel in small boats has hit 100,000 since 2018. That is on the front of the Times. Now, in light of Wilco going into administration, the Metro has the headline, High Street Hammered. Here's the eye. It flags the start of a mortgage rates war, reporting that 13 lenders have cut prices, but let's not forget, millions still facing hikes after base rate rises. Striking doctors are just, quotes, harming patients, the Daily Mail reports, and the health secretary's demands that doctors stop their strikes. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, will go down in history for failing the climate. That's according to Greenpeace, and it's the exclusive on the front of The Guardian. In his hands, I see what they did there. The headline on the front of The Sun, it's reporting on Tottenham star Harry Kane's transfer saga. Uh, will we be off to the German club Bayern Munich? I'm sure we will find out shortly. And the Daily Star reports that Brits are swapping traditional holiday destinations for Belgium uh, to beat the global warming crisis. It's headline, Costa del Dull. It's a bit harsh. Uh, a reminder that by sta scanning the QR code you'll be seeing on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages whilst watching us discuss them. Technology is remarkable these days. Uh, we're joined tonight by Ian Dunt and Katie Bowles. Lovely to see you and not in two dimensions for once. Actually, in real thing, I'll, I'll give you all a, a little squeeze later on just to make sure that you are actually here. <laughs> but let's start, um, shall we, Katie, with, with the front of the eye. Uh, the mortgage rates war begins. Explain. Yeah, so this is um, ultimately about the fact that we keep talking about when you're going to get the peak rates on mortgages, but actually major lenders cutting mortgage rates and the competition increasing. Um, so Halifax NetWest, latest to reveal price uh, reductions when it comes to five-year deals. Now, it's still going to be a nasty shock for lots of people who are coming to the end of their fixed-term mortgages. Um, so I don't think we should uh, misread this or misinterpret this as, oh, um, you know, things are getting much better. But uh, if you think back, I think, to, you know, just even a few weeks ago when uh, mortgage rates were going higher than the, after the mini-budget and all mm. those things, it could be that we're now, you know, at the peak, things are coming down, there's more competition, that is good news, um, even if it is something which is, you know, it might be a little bit less, uh, it's still going to be painful, but it might be in the right direction of travel at least. Ian, what are you thinking? I mean, to be fair, look, any kind of competition that's, that's forcing kind of rates downwards in the mortgage market is going to be welcome. But as Katie's saying, look, we're, we're all still paying a lot more than we used to. Yeah, and look, in Downing Street, there'll obviously be this sense of, like, maybe there's a slight improvement in the situation, maybe this will reduce the degree of punishment that we'll get in the election next year. And the timelines don't work for that. Politically, they've never really worked. The time lag on inflation on all of these decisions is just too slow. I'd say the same goes for NHS waiting times, for instance. Even if Sunak can sit there and go, I've actually managed to hit one of my pledges, it won't feel that way to most people. Nevertheless, if you're taking out a mortgage now, there's this kind of ferocious pressure that's put on you of make the decision right now, two year, five year, whatever else. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, next week, the week after, this rate could be getting worse. And this is a decision, like, if you think about what that's like for people, that's a decision that counts for the next, what, 30 years of your life and you're put under this extraordinary pressure. So just the fact that that's starting to alleviate a little bit will still be very good news for a lot of people. Um, Ian, why don't you take us to, to the front of the Belfast Telegraph, um, the very latest on, on, on what has been happening over there. I think everyone accepts that this is an, a, an almost inexcusable data breach, that, that there, are, there is security concerns. We've spoken to one wife of one serving officer over there. He's, you know, they're, they're checking under their cars like they used to back in the, in the bad old days. But the police chief is suggesting that he's going to remain in post and, and sort it all out. Yeah, I mean, his argument is the classic argument that you always hear, of, like, I have to take responsibility for this, I'm going to take responsibility for fixing it. I mean, mm. we now know that they're dealing with two security breaches. Yeah. 
So one of them, as far as we can tell, involves a laptop in a car. The initial one reported earlier this week was about an FOI request where seemingly the entirety of an Excel document was put up online for about two hours. So we're dealing with thousands of names here and we're dealing with people who will, in many cases, have not even really told their families or certainly not told their friends, you know, that they were part of the police force. So it's a very, very acute situation that they're dealing with at the moment. I mean, j just in terms of the fact that this came out from, from an FOI, I mean, it, it often happens. You, get, you put in an FOI request, the, the information goes up on the website, and you just hope, you absolutely hope that no one else has managed to see it published publicly <laughs> on the website before you manage to get your story out there. This is of a different order, though, and I'm still struggling to work out how this information could have accidentally been attached to an FOI, because the first thing they do is go through with a black pen and mm. wipe out all the bits that they don't want you to see. It's, it's very rare, um, we were saying this uh, before we came on as a journalist, to get more than you would expect from an FOI. Mm. You normally, as you say, seeing lots of redacted information, um, where in this case it seems to be the opposite scenario. So it's very strange. Um, now, they've called it a human error in terms of how much is put out there, so you do wonder that we need to have more details of it, speculation, whether it's just someone who didn't quite know what they were meant to be doing, or if it was just an error in which document was released. Mm. Um, but it was up there for about three hours, two, three hours. Mm. Um, and the fact you already have certain groups saying, uh, claiming they have access to it, something that's not yet been verified, is clearly going to be causing great alarm for I mean, the that, people that, who are on that list. That's, I mean, that's, that's the concerning aspect of this story, isn't it? That over the past you know, few, few months, and uh, indeed years, we, we have seen the violence creeping back into Northern Ireland and police officers specifically being targeted, haven't we? Yeah, and it was only quite recently you had an off-duty detective who uh, has uh, life-changing injuries, um, ultimately uh, due to uh, this type of uh, violence. So I think there's very little comfort, and they are providing support uh, to... I mean, I think support's available for all, but only a certain number are currently receiving it. Um, but. I think that's just not going to alleviate um, the worry, particularly until we get more details as to whether mm. the claims they have information and whether those various paramilitary groups is uh, true or not. Um, let's go, shall we, to, to, to the front of The Guardian. Um, Katie, take us away on this one. I mean, it is, it is Greenpeace's view, of course, uh, that the Prime Minister will go down in history for, for failing on the climate. But, you know, Greenpeace and Rishi Sunak have had a bit of a complicated relationship of late. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's a mild way of putting it. Um, yeah, and ultimately this is the latest twist in, in this tussle between Greenpeace and Downing Street. Now, Greenpeace uh, ultimately pulled a, a stunt um, on the Prime Minister's home, not Number 10, his private home in his constituency, um, where protesters uh, went onto the building. Um, and this, I think, is safe to say appalled quite uh, a lot of people, particularly in the Tory party, mm. and as a result, ministers have stopped interacting with Greenpeace on many levels. Now, in this uh, interview that The Guardian have done, uh, figures in Greenpeace are talking almost of their, uh, how surprised they are, um, ultimately suggesting that they they didn't think they don't think this matches uh, the level of the stunt they did. They think this is an overreaction, and they make the point that yes, they may have gone to the prime minister's personal residence, um, but they made sure he was on holiday before uh, they did it. Um, so therefore, it, sh it shouldn't re receive this. I think if you are going to do something like this, which was clearly an attention-seeking stunt. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is going to be a reaction. Um, now, maybe they misunderstood it, or perhaps, you know, uh, if Greenpeace have already decided that the government's position is not one it can agree to, both sides are getting something from this in how this is playing out and, and the attention now for what Greenpeace is saying, which is effectively trashing the government's record on the environment. Uh, what, what, what do you feel, um, Ian? Because I have to admit, you know, Will McCallum from Greenpeace says in this piece, locking us out is a way of denying civil servants a way of engaging with a civil society group that is desperately trying to make sure they're equipped to go into negotiation with the UN, for example, on deep sea mining or, 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 or so on and so forth. Well, look, I mean, if, if Greenpeace were being genuinely that altruistic, what did they think the government would do <laughs> after they decked out the Prime Minister's house in black cloth and sat on the roof? The fact he was not there, I, I wonder, it may well be neither here or there. Mm. I can't, I, I've got to say, it's quite hard to argue with that opinion. Like, it, you're going to play two different roles. Mm. Like, one of them when you're an organisation like this is you want to be advising civil servants, you want to be advising government, and most importantly, if we're realistic about it, you're usually advising the opposition. Of course. Because the opposition don't have access to a civil service, they really need guys like you to come talk to, to try and bounce ideas off to get data from. The other one is that you're a sort of agitprop, mm -hmm. you know, spectacular protest demonstration. 
it's quite hard to straddle that line. And I think they've got themselves in quite a, a funny position here. Is that, is, that, is that because, but that's because, because as the article points out, stunts like this have taken place before. But, you know, politicians' homes have been targeted in the past. I mean, is this of a piece with the kind of the, the, the increasing kind of public backlash against what we're seeing from Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion and the direct action that they've participated in? See, I think there's a real difference here. Mm -hmm. I find the Just Stop Oil protest quite hard to accept because mm -hmm. they, just in terms of like your communication strategy, right, you're aiming your protest at against the public. Whether it's a sporting event or a road, you're basically saying, I'm aiming to make your life less convenient. If you go to the Prime Minister's house, that seems like a completely legitimate protest to me. It's the Prime Minister, yeah. really, he's making the decisions. The protest itself is fine, but you do have to recognise there are going to be consequences to that when you do it in terms of your ability to access civil service and ministers. Yeah, and I also do think it's partly, um, currently, uh, you have both parties, in a way, wanting to say, oh, we're not that green. We're a bit green, though. <laughs> um, but also, it's um, the fact that if you think in recent years, threats towards MPs, personal safety. I do think it just adds to this climate where people are taking these quite seriously. And yes, they might not be there, but it does suggest that perhaps people can get to the Prime Minister's uh, private residence if they really want to, which mm. is quite worrying if you are, you know, an MP or the Prime Minister. It certainly is. Um, Ian, take us to the front of the Metro. And, and, and actually, it's been quite interesting in the office today, just, you know, you've been doing, doing a little bit of an experiment around finding out who actually knows what Wilco is and whoever has stepped inside. I was genuinely gobsmacked by how many people had never been inside because, you know, it's a shop that I've used and I would have used again. Because evidently you're better at DIY than I am. Because oh, I God, no, you've not been in my <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am terrible at DIY and gardening, so this is not a shop that I use very often. But you can tell by the strength of the emotional reaction. I mean, so one of the sort of things that was said on your bulletin earlier was someone comparing it to Woolworths, of basically saying, look, this is somewhere that I clearly have some long-term affinity with and some sort of sense of warmth towards. Mm -hmm. The number of jobs, of course, is the more yeah, profound problem. Absolutely. And there stands at 12,500 in jeopardy that... There is, you know, it is perfectly possible that those jobs will remain. But for the time being, if you're one of them, this is going to be a very nervous couple of weeks. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's also, uh, obviously, it's really worrying if you're an employee. But I think there's also, when the worst comments are touched, of, you know, if you go back to concerns about high streets, mm -hmm. supposed to be centres of the community, and lots of these brands closing down a pattern um, and what replaces it. And you had recently uh, the government looking at relaxing rules so it's easier to turn some of these. Um, shops into housing, which could be a good thing. Could be but, fantastic. Um, but of course, uh, also it means perhaps it's less of a community hub, which is what we traditionally saw high streets to say. So it feels, you know, a bit of a, a change in what we probably perhaps are going to get from the high streets if this, these trends continue. Mm. Uh, guys, we will pause there for a second because coming up, up after the break, we'll be discussing whether holidaying in Belgium is as rubbish as the Daily Star makes it sound. Uh, we'll discuss that next. Clue, it's not, I promise you. Welcome back to the press preview. Ian and Katie still here. And um, Ian, why don't you have a go on striking doctors? Uh, mm. Apparently, according to the front of the Daily Mail, they are just hurting, uh, harming patients. Who's, who's that according to? This is from the Health Secretary. And mm. the Health Secretary is rather bound to say it because on the subject of uh, Rishi Sunak's various pledges, one of them was to reduce NHS waiting lists. Uh, and we've now found that since last month, there's another 100,000 people on these waiting lists. It's not a problem that is getting better. It is getting worse. And he is right to say that one of the reasons it's getting worse is because of the strikes. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one disagrees with that. The strikers don't disagree with that. The whole purpose of doing a strike is so that you actually, you know, demonstrate your point by removing service. So no one disputes that point. The point is, like, whose fault is it mm -hmm. that these talks have continued to go absolutely nowhere? How useful is it that Rishi Sunak says he simply will not uh, go into any further negotiation. Yeah, I mean, but even the government, the government was even maintaining today that there were informal discussions taking place, which mm -hmm. the BMRA turned around and said was absolute tosh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, look, it's been, a, it's been a terrible spectacle watching them do this over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. It has ended them up in this position, but, but the crucial strategic point is this. If Sunak comes out and says, I'm staking my reputation on a, an improvement in service in the NHS, mm -hmm. then they have got his head in a lock because they do have the power, as Barclay is saying here, mm -hmm. to make life very, very difficult for him indeed. Katie? Yeah, I mean, I think the junior doctors obviously have a massive impact, and doctors more generally, when it comes to the waiting lists. 
Um, but you are now seeing this new attack uh, from the government where I think they are much happier to just um, almost try and blame the strikers as opposed to say we're in talks and all those things. And that's partly mm. because there's been a slight divide and rule tactic. So if you look at the fact teachers, for example, mm. uh, you know, recently voted to accept the pay offer, uh, nurses, uh, you know, accepting pay offers, and you had the, you know, it means I think it's a bit easier in government. They're always most worried about nurses in terms of where the public sympathy was. Of course. Um, and then also teachers, I think, is something where they thought, uh, after lockdown, particularly having kids out of school. And therefore, with the junior doctors particularly, there's often this attempt to say, well, the BMA are unreasonable. Look at these, um, you know, look at what they're doing when they're off. And I think you're seeing some of this in uh, the comments now from the health secretary um, and trying to win that fairness argument in the public whereby, uh, you know, picking apart junior doctors as separate to the other ones. Mm -hmm. And now, will it work? I think ultimately, to Ian's point, if people cannot get a doctor's appointment, I think eventually the government gets blamed. <laughs> um, but well, I think and, and, we've got, and we've got an excess of 7 million electives, you know, exactly. waiting, waiting, that, that, that are overdue. Do you know what? Let's, let, let's try and end on a, on, a, on a slightly more positive note. A great run of front pages, I have to say, from the Star this week. This is perhaps not their best one. Uh, but they are suggesting, uh, because the Costa is just a wee bit too warm these days. We're all off to Belgium on our holidays. Really? Come on. And I felt that you were gearing up for a defence of Belgium. I like the, the place. I like the place and I like the people. I mean, the idea that it is dull compared to Benidorm is just beyond me. But at the same time, I can see why not many people would necessarily go straight there as their desired yeah. holiday I mean, destination. I like the sun so much I'm going on holiday to Scotland. Um, Get in, there we are. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I recently spent two hours in Brussels on the way somewhere. Mm. Um, I it didn't make me think I was going to book a fortnight there, but um, <laughs> you never, you never know. I think I'll go a bit colder. I mean, look, I say you this. You said you is... couldn't find it. You didn't enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, don't dub me in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I say it as a sort of committed Remainer. Like it is, Brussels is awful. I mean, as a destination. It's just dreadful. The beer is chronically overrated. The food yeah. is no good. It is yeah. unbelievably cold in a way that's not fully just described. Just go outside Brussels. But I have to say, mm -hmm. Katie, where in Scotland are you heading to? Um, roughly. Yeah, I'm going to the Highlands for a bit. Wonderful. Absolutely. As well as and stopping by the Fringe. Yeah, I, I will say, just watch out for the midges in the Highlands. Yeah. We, we used to use them as torture devices uh, on Sassanax. I don't think they do that anymore, <laughs> though, I have to say. Uh, Ian, Katie, thank you both very much indeed.